I'd like you to take your Bibles at this time and turn with me to Genesis. I was going to say the gospel according to Genesis. That would have been okay, wouldn't it? There's gospel in every book of this wonderful book. And it's the job of a preacher and a leader of the home to bring that out to the children. There's only one word, isn't there? One word is Jesus Christ. And that's the gospel, the gospel of our salvation. And so we want to read here this gospel according to Genesis in chapter 3, and I want to read here, uh, beginning at verse 7, and then through the end of the chapter, and I want us to be mindful of the fact that there's Advent here. We speak of Advent as the time when Jesus comes to the earth, Advent, comes to the earth, and that's Christmas time, of course, but I think there was a sort of Christmas or certainly an Advent season that's already begun in the gospel according to Genesis. Let's look for that, shall we? First of all, in the reading of God's holy word, Genesis 3, verse 7. The eyes of them, Adam and Eve, both were opened, and they knew that they were naked and sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every feast of the a beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go. And dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. And in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken." For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil, and now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubim, or cherubims, angels, and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Thus far we read God's sacred word. This passage in its entirety will be my text uh, for this morning as we contemplate and continue to contemplate the various doctrines of the whole counsel of God here, now from the perspective of Genesis. And we've noted already last time that in Genesis 3 is certainly the darkest, one of the darkest pages of human history. You have the fall of Adam and of Eve, who were God's favored creatures, who had been Uh, made in the image of God and for fellowship with God. And they had fallen from that by their willful choice of 
well, for themselves and for the devil and for a sort of freedom that they thought they would have if they just disobeyed God in this one area where the devil had convinced them God was being unfair. So we have here the iniquitous beginning of the dark and bloody ground of this world and Adam and Eve leading the way. Hellions at this point are let loose on the earth. The devil and his minions have their way among the sons of men. They've found their way into the, the citadel of the man's soul of which Bunyan speaks. They're having their way now with Adam and Eve, these hellions are, so that Adam and Eve can be willing servants of the devil, even though they had thought to be liberated even from God. And so it's dark. It's very dark indeed in this record of the scripture and in this sacred account which is infallible. But lo, lo, behold, hark, people of God, in the very same chapter of the chaos of sin is the light of the world shining in the dark place. There in Genesis 3, this before our eyes recorded for us at the very beginning of history is grace shining to the ungodly. There is God having his way, though his people have chosen for their way, and God having his way to show the glories of his grace. There is God coming, look at that, finding out Adam and Eve, and they're hiding behind the fig leaves and then behind the fig trees, trying to escape the consequences of their sin and also the responsibility that they have for that sin. God comes, never forsaking his own. And this, in fact, is what Advent is all about. We want to know what Christmas is all about. We want to know what the birth of the Christ child in Bethlehem is all about. It's right here, and many a person misses the real meaning of history because they don't, or the real meaning of Christmas, because they don't go back into what all history is really all about, God coming to save sinners. And that culmination of that coming and of that advent, indeed, in the sending of his Son. So we need at this time, once again, as we do every Sunday, to come away from the entire world. I invite you, in fact, to the Word of God and via the Word of God to heaven itself and to a reassessment of everything glitzy and glamorous and Hollywoodish and everything merely sentimental. Let's go into the sanctuary where I believe we'll find grace. We'll, behind, we'll find even more than a bundle of tender human joy will find this grace that saves even in the incarnate Son who long ago was coming to find our first parents hiding in the garden. May God come now and find us as we're hiding, as we're despairing, and find us that we can find ourselves not only, but Him and His grace. The advent of grace or first grace is what I entitled this sermon. Three points Garden grace, mother grace, and now grace. First of all, that grace in the garden. I want to speak about how this Genesis 3 passage is really the mother. It's speaking of the, the beginning of all these little children of grace that will visit the earth. And then, now grace, and God come to us. Well, the sad <clears throat> fact of Genesis 3... We have to rehearse for a few minutes to see all the brighter that grace that God shows. We, the sad fact is man will disgrace and take every one of those words and chew on it. Man will disgrace or man will dis fellowship himself from God. That's what happened here. Lucifer came 
Remember that great and fallen angel of which Revelation speaks? He'd been great, but he'd led a rebellion of the angels. Now we know what happened to Lucifer in the garden. He took the form of a snake, starts talking to Eve, spreading the lie about God, would get at God indirectly, through getting at God's creature, and deceives Eve into thinking that God's not fair, that God's not really going to keep his word and punish them with death should they partake of the forbidden fruit, really makes a mockery of God and God's word. That's the devil's way always. You have to remember that. But Eve took up the conversation. Bad news. Never take up a conversation with the devil, but that's what she did. Listened to the devil. Something in her was wanting even what the devil wanted, even before she took of it. There's some inglorious beginning of sin already now. And so Eve is there conversing with the devil and then finds that maybe she ought to partake of this forbidden fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Maybe there's something missing in my character that this God, of whose fairness I'm questioning right now, that's what she was thinking, has said, I may not eat. So Eve took and then Adam took. They followed Satan's lead. We know that sad story. They believed his lie. They chose to imagine vain things, better things than life with God and under God and for God because if you're going to have a life with God, it has to be under God and for God. They thought of something better. They thought maybe that they could call the shots they could get up at whatever time they wanted and go to bed whatever time they wanted, work at whatever they wanted to do, have their own projects, their own free time, their own Friday nights. This was the way of Adam and Eve. They were thinking along this pattern. And so they thought to determine their future and to get glory for themselves. Now, we know, as we heard last time in the preaching, that the fall was great and the fallout was great. The consequences were just as God had said. They died. God doesn't lie. He said to Adam, in the day you eat of it, you're going to die. And they died. Well, of course, Adam and Eve are there talking. And they will have children. And, of course, they're not dead permanently and physically and to the dust immediately returned. But they began to die. Their bodies began to become uh, these dying bodies. These bodies that would become carcasses, as it were. And they would go and go to the ground and decompose and become the dust, just as God had said. But spiritually, we saw uh, last time, especially this was the, the result of the fall. God put them in bondage where they thought to be free. He held them under in his wrath. This was God showing anger here. They would be dead. They would be deprived of the privilege of fellowship with God. Because you see, sinners may not have fellowship with God. He is righteous. Only those of a pure heart can ascend into the holy hill. Not any with any sin whatsoever can be God's friend. That's the terrible thing that happened to Adam and Eve. They had this desire for God. The desire was turned into desire for themselves. They had this mind to think the thoughts of God, and they started minding the things of Satan. They had this love for God. It turned into the love of, well, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. It was all about themselves. They were oriented toward God. Now they became, well, it was all about me. And in the swamp of their depravity, they started building mountains and towers to self. Mount Egos, as we've called them. Here a mount, there a mount, in the swamp. Mount, mount, mount. And it was all to humankind. It would become a Babel later on. So that humans could make a name for themselves. And we said this all about, don't want to dwell on it too long, but it's all something of which God was not happy. He desires not these mountains of men and these good things that men can do, even today in technology and culture and civilization and everything. If the mountains are built with nary a thought to the glory of God, you ever think about that? Wake-up call for all of us. You want to build your mountains? Have a career? Go to college and become something? Do something? Remember, 
If God's not at the center, God's not pleased with your legs. He's not pleased with your inventions, not pleased with your bank account, not pleased with your church going. He wants your heart. Doesn't Jesus say that? Here's the commandment. Love God with all your heart, mind and strength and soul. Well, Adam and Eve, they, they fell into this kind of humanism. The first humans became the first humanists. Striking. Adam and Eve fell, and we know from the rest of the Bible that the whole race fell in them. Not going to speak about that doctrine this morning, but we believe in the doctrine of original sin and original guilt. In Adam all die, the apostle says. In Adam all were represented. Adam fell, the whole race became guilty before God and were conceived and born in sins. This is total depravity of the whole human race. None of us born little angels. Not the first birth. Born in sin. Dead in trespasses and sins, the apostle says. But no, we want to talk about Advent. We talked about but man invented sin. Now we talk about the advent of God. That's the coming of God. Note this. I have so many different ways to talk to you about this coming of grace. And I'm going to narrow it to seven here. But let's, let's think about how God shows his grace here. First of all, Genesis 3.8. There Adam and Eve are hiding in the garden. And they're naked and they have fig leaves together, uh, they've sewn together. And then there's this voice that they hear, verse 8. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and Eve and his wife, they, they hide themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Just, just think about that, um, first of all. We don't know exactly what this visitation of God was, what this voice of the Lord God was. It's described here in ways we can try to grasp as humans. He was walking, talking to them. There's a voice and he's walking. Cool of the day, we're not sure exactly what time that was. It may have been a normal time of their meeting with God, but here it's God meeting with them and they're hiding from him. Well, I want to present to you the gospel here, the gospel according to Genesis 3, 8. Adam and Eve hiding. Have this? They're hiding. You ever hide from your moms and dads? They're hiding from the Father in heaven, trying desperately to do something to make up for the loss of their integrity. They're hiding behind fig leaves. God comes to them. They hear him. Before, they probably would have run up and said, Yes, God, great to meet with you again today. Here, they don't want to have anything to do with this God anymore. They're hiding. But God, you see, is coming. And this is what grace is. This is Advent. This is Christmas. This is everything about the Christian religion. Right here. What is it, you say? Pastor, what is the gospel here? I don't hear of Jesus right here or of anything of the word grace. Oh, but you do. Because it's God, you see, initiating the contact. That is what the Christian religion is about. Sinners, they don't come to God. For all the exaltation of free will is made in many a church. Here, you have no desire for God except to get away from God. They're hiding. God comes to them. And that's First John, the apostle of love's statement of what love is. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. That's what it's all about. That means, of course, salvation... Restoration to fellowship with God is not at all dependent upon us, sinners. Sinners hide, sinners flee, sinners cover up. Grace is unmerited favor to those sinners. Grace is God making us willing in the day of his power, but his power is first. Grace is God making us alive when we were dead. 
Grace is God raising us from the dead. Grace is God finding us, to use the metaphor here of hiding and seeking. So this is it. Once had a forum that was led on one of the secular campuses here, and I was to represent Protestantism of all of the different religions. And there were many different religions represented there, and I happened to lead a campus group in that place. And there were the Roman Catholics, and there were Lutherans, I suppose, and other... Well, no, I was the, the only Protestant, the token Protestant. There were the ways of the earth folks, whoever they are. There were the Muslims and the Buddhists, and we all were gathered around, and the talk was for probably half an hour of how much we have in common, and I was quiet. How much we have in common, and we ought to get together and help these kids on the campus and so on. And finally, we were about to close, and I said, you know, Mr. Moderator, I think I have a, a little question here. I wonder if we could discuss the differences among the religions. Well, the moderator agreed to that and said, okay, everybody here say one thing where you think you are different from the others. What, how does your religion stand out from them? And somebody said this and somebody said that. And, you know, I, I, didn't, I wasn't exactly ready. There's so many different things about Christianity. But I thought of this, and I think it's accurate to be sure. Christianity is about this Grace. Christianity, in distinction from all the other religions which say we have to climb up to get to God, says no, God comes down. The Christ child is the reason for the season. God coming down when sinners could not go up. The God of the garden finding hidden Adam and Eve trying to protect themselves and in their display of the first self-righteousness He comes and he says, no, you have offended me and there's no way you can make up for that. But I come to you. I'm not done with you yet. I grace you. Well, and that's why the second aspect of grace is is right and very clear here. God calls to discover their sin. Notice that in verse 9. God talks with them. The voice that comes is the, the, the piercing voice of God, the righteous God. The Lord God calls unto Adam, whom he's found. And he said to him, Where art thou? And Adam said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And, and then God says, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree where I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? And the man said, The woman whom you gave me to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did it. You see, he's, he's excusing himself. And the Lord God says to the woman, What's this thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me and I did eat. And the Lord then curses the ser- serpent. What we find here is what God does When he comes to a sinner, he calls the sinner. So he comes in his grace, he comes and he's there and he wants the conversation. He calls in the conversation and he calls us to account for who we are and to remember who he is. That's the second thing of grace. Kind of like what God did in the fullness of the time when he sent John the Baptist and would visit the people Israel who sat in darkness. He called them to repentance by John the Baptist. And then he sent the Christ child. So here in the garden, God comes to Adam and Eve. That's grace. He calls Adam and Eve to, to s- discover to them their selfishness, their irresponsibility. They're blaming the wife. They're blaming the husband. They're blaming the snake. They're blaming God. And then he promises, and this is the heart of it, the Christ. Verse 15, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed. He's talking to the snake here. Between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Oh, this is the great mother promise. And again, we have to only examine this uh, Uh, very briefly at this time, but this is worthy, of course, of a sermon all by itself. Here, God is looking at that snake who was the instrument of the temptation. And he says, there's going to be something different than what you thought. 
See, the snake had thought he'd gained the whole human race to himself. I'm going to get Adam and Eve, and in getting at Adam and Eve, I get to the whole humanity, and I'm going to get at God. That's what the devil's ploy was. God says, no, you're not. He says, snake, I'm going to put a difference between you and that woman, that Eve, that first woman, and between your children, snake, and Eve's children. There's going to be a difference called enmity. The enmity is a spiritual separation. They're not going to be united and massed together in fallen humanity so that it's hopeless for my people. No. God says here, there's going to be a distinction, and the distinction is going to be caused by the seed of the woman itself. Note that. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. In other words, there's a child coming, this seed of the woman, this child of the woman, who's going to stomp on the head of the snake, even though at the same time the snake's going to bite the heel. Do you know what that is? Do I need to tell you who that is? That's Jesus. Jesus is the great snake crusher. And when he comes, even the book of Hebrews says he crushes him who held the power of death. Jesus crushes the head of the snake. Jesus comes from the woman. Don't you see here? Here's Advent here in the bud. Here's Advent here, the, the gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in Genesis. Here it is. I will put this difference. I will send a seed of this woman. The woman blew it, but this seed will not. Jesus, the reason for the season, the light of Genesis 3. He's really the center of it all. God comes to Adam and Eve. That's the first sea of grace. And children, you've got to remember all these seas. There's seven of them. He comes, he calls to discover sin. He promises the Christ child who will make a difference so that God's own are saved. That's the center of it. Without it, we miss everything. All the others serve, and I'll just be brief about the other four seas that I have of grace. God curses the ground. He makes uh, this life unlivable except uh, for a man or a woman or a boy or a girl. He makes it very hard. He makes thorns and thistles. He makes pregnancy hard to endure and very tearful. He makes the marriage to be a place of antagonism and, and tyranny and so on. But in all, I think, this is a blessing for God's people. You know why? You know why it's a blessing for us to have to sweat men as we're monkeying around under the chassis of a car? You know why it's a blessing that we have to eke out a living sometimes and maybe all the time? It's so that we're led to another world. I think that's a blessing, don't you? I think we're led to discover anew the things that are divine and eternal when life is hard, when it's not so easy. Even to get along with people, God is reminding us of his grace and of heaven. And so you have that, even in the cursing of the ground. And then, of course, in chapter 3 and verse 21, you had God himself making coats of skins and clothing Adam and Eve. And I believe this is even the first clothing of the righteousness of Christ. Adam and Eve took of the earth fig leaves. God said there's a better way. It's through a sacrifice. He killed an animal here, must have. The Lord God made coats of skins, animal skins, and then he clothed them. And I believe here is the first promise of the clothing of the righteousness of Christ who is pictured in the sacrifices of all the Old Testament animals that were slain. Blood had to be shed so that Adam and Eve could be right with God. So you have this, there's debate about this covering, but I believe it is part of the gospel here. So clothing, covenant clothing. And then I believe that also that God is curing the heart. Notice I'm saying I believe here, and I'm, I'm not speculating, but I think it's biblical to believe this. God cured the heart of Adam and Eve. Some believe, even some otherwise biblical people, that Adam himself, maybe Eve too, were not saved. I believe they were. I believe Adam and Eve were saved, 
And that's evident, I think, in Adam's hope in verse 20 of calling his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. It means living or something similar to that. And so Adam has hope here. There's renewed hope in the promises of God, in the fellowship of God. He's a child of God. He cures the heart. And then finally, I believe there's gospel in God casting man and woman out of the garden. Why, you say? Well, the Lord God recognizes that there's this power in this tree, that not in itself, but that God has ordained as a kind of a sacrament, the tree of life, to give life forever on the earth. But God, you see, does not want man and woman to live forever on the earth. He wants to live, uh, them to live in heaven. And besides, if Adam and Eve were to stay in the garden at this time, there would be this place and there would be um, this existence here of a kind of immortality of, of death. You see, they have to go out into the world and have children, and the Christ has to come forth. There cannot be this existence anymore without the coming forth of the Christ child, who is the way, the truth, and the life. Life is not in the eating of a tree. Life is in Jesus. That's what they had to learn through this. They had to be cast out of this place of perfection and needing this place of recreation in Jesus. Now, I stammered a few things. And again... I wanted to make this simple about the coming of Jesus and about grace. It's about grace, isn't it? The advent of the gospel, God coming to Adam and Eve, his calling to them, his promising Christ to them, his cursing the ground, his clothing them, his curing their heart, his casting them out of the Garden of Eden. And I believe, too, this is what we would call the mother of all grace. This first display of grace that shows us that there's more grace to come. This is, in fact, what is so beautiful about the rest of this history, beloved. We are heirs of what God would do in history, and he began to do it right here. This is why this is recorded here, not just for Adam and Eve, but for all of us. When God came to them, he came... And he came loaded, as it were, with more grace. He came to show this grace, which would be as a mother who has many children. This mother of grace, this promise of the Christ, will show itself in so many, many different ways. It's a good thing. Because sure as sin is sin, that will display itself after Adam and Eve. That will come, there will be more sin but to conquer the sin in every individual of God's good pleasure, in all of his elect, there will be grace to cover that sin too. The guarantee is, in fact, in the Son, who is the mediator of grace and who will come in the fullness of time, and how we need to hear that. Grace comes. Grace comes on Christmas Day in reality, in the flesh. This is what I want to leave you with and then apply it to your life. What was it when Jesus came? I think it was just like, and even worse, when Adam and Eve had fallen. Jesus came to the Jews, supposed to be the promised people of God supposed to have the gospel in all the Old Testament revealed. They had the prophets and so on, but lo and behold, they're fallen. The axe is laid to the root of the tree of this people Israel. And God is ready to show the glories of his grace in going to all the world, all the nations. We find, in fact, the religious cream of the crop, the Pharisees, doing just what Adam and Eve were doing, hiding. Behind what? their own self-righteousness. They had a righteousness and a zeal, but it was not according to the knowledge of grace. They lost it. Oh, terrible. The Pharisees would come and Jesus would have to tell them, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. 
I came to call you, and there you are hiding behind yourselves and all your stuff and all your deeds. I don't want your sermons, he said. I don't want your prayers. I don't want anything but a broken spirit and a contrite heart. These my father will not despise. I come, and there must be bloodshed for you, Nicodemus. And there must be the Holy Spirit who causes you to be born again. And your pedigree and your lineage will not save you. They're just like Adam and Eve hiding. And God calls them through John the Baptist and then through Jesus himself to repent. God sends the promised seed of the woman born of the Virgin Mary. Sends him to die. Sends him so that the devil's head would indeed be crushed by one who is bruised. Who dies as well. But who rises again. And this is what Christmas is all about. And Christmas is all about grace now coming to us. If we're getting this. Grace has already come to us. And that's why we go to the stores, buy things or whatever. But that's not the main thing of Christmas. It's what God has given to us. Has God come to you that way? Really, there's really a repetition of all of Genesis 3 here. and In every one of our lives, we're born sinners, but God comes to us and he finds us in maybe whatever respectable place we might be at whatever age. And he says, you're a sinner. And he calls us to discover our sins for ourselves and to repent of them. That's what he does here in the gospel preaching. He comes to sinners and he says, now, you're a sinner. Don't you know that? And here's the promise of Jesus Christ, and you believe on him. And I come just in the church services and where there's faithful proclamation of the word. And I declare to you that all who trust in him indeed are covered by his righteousness. Do that, he says. And now, this is what happens to us. And it happens to us even again and again, not just when we're first visited by God. But I think God came to me this past week. Did he come to you? He came to me and he rediscovered for me my sins. And now I need to repent of them. And he re-impressed me with the truth that it's all of grace. Right, Reverend Dick. It's all of grace. Not of status. You're a mere sinner. Again and again, right? We hide ourselves in our hilarity, in our religiosity in our bottles and we're all attempting to run from God so prone to leave the God I love God comes to us now maybe it's the case with you you're running from God hiding what degree are we running from God whoever's hearing this are you hiding from God really you're honest with yourself, and what are you saying? Is Christmas about what we bring to Bethlehem or what we put under the tree? What is it about? Is it family gathering together? Oh, no doubt in many of our homes it is, and we see the fruit of that in our own congregation today. Family, wonderful thing. But is that really the meaning of it? I thought... Because Genesis taught, it's about God coming to us and God finding us. I think because the New Testament says it's about this Christ child who's born. I thought it was because God came down and, and there he was and there were the angels saying glory to God in the highest. And, and here is this wonderful sign I give to you, this babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. I thought it was about this wonder child. And I was right. 
Let's so think, shall we? First Advent, may we bear first fruits of that as a church too. A church that's visited by grace will preach sovereign grace. A church and the homes and families and individuals that are visited by grace will show off all that God has done for us and all that he's doing for us. We'll show, too, that we believe in the first advent and also the second one when he comes again in glory. First grace, the advent of our salvation and Savior. Praise the Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray your blessing upon us. May we go forth in peace and happiness and joy. You're the God who visits us in our sins. And you lift us up and you cover us with Jesus' blood. And you give us of your spirit and so we're alive to things eternal. We thank you, Lord, for visiting our first parents, Adam and Eve. Oh, God, visit us this day and visit many. Discover to us our sin and of our need for Jesus and work in us to trust and to be at peace with the living God and to know that all is well. Grace has come. Grace is coming again. And we can hardly wait for that second and eternal taste of grace. And we with all the saints are with you and God is with us in that eternal paradise from which there is no falling. We will be kept forever. Amen.